Let's say you want to throw away some tattered clothes or those old electronic wires you never use anymore. What would you do about it? There are a number of options. But is dumping this waste in your neighbor's backyard one of them? Hopefully, the answer is no. Since you are not Europe, because that's exactly what the continent has been up to. It is taking used clothes, electronics and everything in between and just dumping it in the global south. That is Asia and Africa. These continents have become the ideal dumping ground for 90% of Europe's clothing waste. But that's not all. Europe is the biggest generator of e-waste in the world, most of which finds its way to landfills in Asia and Africa. And the number of waste exports have only risen over the years. Despite several warning calls, growing environmental pressures and health problems among millions. Our next report brings you more. The Global South has become a dumping ground for Europe. Anything and everything Europe doesn't need is dumped in Asia and Africa. Especially countries like India, Pakistan, Togo, Cameroon, Tunisia and Ghana. And this waste has an eclectic mix of useless things. But it's mostly either used clothes or electronic waste. Let's first talk about textile waste. 90% of Europe's used clothes end up in Asian and African landfills. And that's a lot because Europe generates a staggering 5.8 million tons of textile waste every year. That's about 11 kg of waste per person. In 2019, Africa received over 60% of these used clothes. It used to be the primary destination for unwanted exports. But Asia has emerged as a worthy competitor. Today, it receives 41% of Europe's textile waste, while Africa gets 46%. So Asia and Africa are facing the slow burn of Europe's fast fashion choices. And it isn't just textile waste that is ailing the global south's landfills. It's also electronic waste. This includes old phones, kitchen appliances and even automobiles. Basically, all kinds of electronic devices that are rejected by Europeans. Everything that is no longer worthy for European streets makes it to the southern continents. In fact, even cars that have been involved in terrible accidents are exported to these places. So basically, the brunt of self-serving Europe's selfish choices is being borne by Asia and Africa. This waste is also a safety hazard. It is sometimes dangerous for the people who reuse it. And it is often hazardous to the health of landfill workers. They develop lifelong diseases because of such waste. But this trash is not only bad at micro levels, it is bad for the world as a whole. As amazing as fast fashion sounds, the textile waste it generates is terrible. It is the fourth highest source of environmental pressure one of the biggest reasons behind climate change. And now it is washing up on the shores of Africa. Meanwhile, e-waste not only creates toxic air pollution, it creates a hazardous working environment. Workers develop burns, back problems, infected wounds, and respiratory problems. You must be wondering, why are Asia and Africa suffering from this? Why does Europe rely on them so heavily? Because these two continents are low-cost manufacturing hubs. Europe depends on them for its products, a result of which is the remaining surplus, the leftover from manufacturing like clothes and other products. This practice is great for business in Europe, but it's terrible for the environment. And Europe isn't blind to these facts. Yet, it refuses to take responsibility. Waste management isn't rocket science. So Europe needs to do better. Countries must consume less, produce less, and recycle more. They need sustainable waste management practices because it is criminal for countries to treat others as their personal junkyard. Climate change is not waiting for no one. So Europe needs to wake up and smell the toxins it's dumping in Asia and Africa. Cyclones, floods, drought, wildfires. These disasters are taking place all around the world, at this very moment, in fact. There's a cyclone battering the U.S. territory of Guam in the Pacific Ocean, floods in Spain and Afghanistan, drought in the Horn of Africa, 
wildfires in Canada. All of this is happening as we speak. These extreme weather events are leaving behind a trail of destruction. And the results are catastrophic, both on people and the economy. The World Meteorological Organization has come out with a report. It details the impact of extreme weather over a 50-year period. The death toll is over 2 million. More than 2 million people were killed due to extreme weather events in the last 50 years. Over 90% of these deaths took place in developing countries. The economic losses are worth over $4 trillion. Our next report brings you the details. It should be common knowledge that people should revere Mother Nature or be prepared to face the consequences. Humans seem to have forgotten this bit of wisdom and we've been paying the price. Extreme weather has taken two million lives over the past 50 years. This is according to a report from the World Meteorological Organization or WMO. Two million people have been killed due to extreme weather between 1970 and 2021. And remember, this is just extreme weather, like cyclones, floods and droughts. We aren't talking about things like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Those are considered natural disasters. Extreme weather is different. It's something that human activity can aggravate, which we have done. Since we keep burning fossil fuels and releasing greenhouse gases, this makes extreme weather events more frequent and more calamitous. Let's take a look at what's going on in just the last few days. We first turn to the Pacific island of Guam. It's a US territory in the Pacific. The people there just faced super typhoon Mawar. The tropical cyclone battered the island with wind speeds of over 240 kilometers per hour. It has left now, but the island still faces strong winds. Half a day and good morning. I am so glad we are safe. We have weathered the storm. The worst has gone by, but we are going to continue experiencing tropical storm winds up to about 40, 50 miles per hour. So I ask you again to please stay home for your protection and your safety. Meanwhile, America's northern neighbor is facing dozens of wildfires. Canada's Alberta province is ablaze. Thousands of firefighters from Canada and the U.S. are trying to get the fires under control. There are 71 wildfires in the forest protection area of Alberta. 20 of those are out of control. So far this year, we've responded to 520 wildfires, burning more than 1,017,000 hectares. It's so bad, Australia and New Zealand have pledged to send their firefighters to help out. Then there's Spain. It's facing the full bouquet of disasters. Hailstorms in the north, wildfires and drought in the center, and floods in the east and south. There is no water, and the reservoir has dried up. We don't know what happened, but they tried to fix it, and now we can't drink the water. They're offering us water in trucks. I've lived here since January, and the shame of being from Mercia is that every time it rains, it pours, and everything gets flooded. Because really no effective solutions are put in place to avoid this from happening. So now it's time to check whether insurance will cover all of that. Afghanistan has to deal with extreme weather along with everything else it's going through. At 12.30 during the day, there were a lot of floods. All the villages were flooded and 12 villages are completely destroyed. We have four deaths, we have one wounded and we have faced a lot of damages. And we expect our government to reach out to us to support us. You'll notice how the developed nations were talking about economic damages. The Afghan person spoke of deaths. That contrast is highlighted in the WMO report. Over 90% of the deaths from extreme weather events impact developing countries. Asia and Africa are particularly vulnerable. Extreme weather has killed over half a million people in Bangladesh alone. The country regularly faces cyclones and floods. Then there's the Horn of Africa region. Droughts killed over half a million people in just Ethiopia, Sudan and Somalia between 1970 and 2021. And another drought is currently underway. 
The world knows this, but it isn't doing enough. Crisis on top of crisis is threatening the lives and livelihoods of millions across the Horn of Africa. The longest drought on record. Mass displacement after years of conflict and insecurity. Skyrocketing food prices. And now chaos and fighting have engulfed Sudan, radiating instability across the entire region. I call on donors and the international community to urgently fund the 2023 humanitarian response plan for the region. Today, they are just close to 20% funded, and this is unacceptable. Developed countries pledged about $2.4 billion yesterday. They were quite happy about it, even though the UN says it needs $7 billion. Over the years, rich nations have paid the lion's share for humanitarian assistance and the rebuilding of infrastructure after extreme climate events. The U.S. alone suffered economic losses worth $1.7 trillion since 1970. That's about 40% of the global losses due to extreme weather. Yet, despite the cost, the developed world is still slow to fight climate change. Maybe because they have the money to burn on recovery. The developing world, however, does not have that money. And it pays for the insults to Mother Nature with innocent lives. And here's the latest from Germany. The country is looking to chip in. It's not a metaphor. I mean it literally. They are hoping to end Europe's semiconductor supply woes. It promises to be a challenging task. The basics first. Semiconductors or chips are everywhere. In our phones, in our appliances, even in our cars and in our weapons. But their supply chain is complicated. Most of the chips are produced in Taiwan, Japan and South Korea. If you consider the most advanced ones, around 90% are made in Taiwan, which means the supply chain is vulnerable. If China invades Taiwan, no more chips. So every country is looking to diversify supply. Germany is no different. They are leading the wider European push. The European Union's plan is to double its share in the chip market. It's 10% right now. They are aiming for 20% by 2030. To achieve this, the EU has unveiled the CHIPS Act. The plan is to mobilize $46 billion. And like I said, Germany is leading this push. They're the biggest economy in Europe because they have a knack for engineering. After all, the German car industry is world famous. Berlin is asking chip giants to invest in Germany. Last week, Chancellor Olaf Scholz traveled to South Korea. He asked Korean chip companies to set up plants in Germany. And how's the response? Not too bad. German chip maker Infineon is setting up a facility in Dresden. Total cost? Around $5.3 billion. US companies like Intel and Wolfspeed have also announced projects. But Germany is betting on the big fish. I'm talking about TSMC. It is arguably the most advanced chip maker in the world. It is based in Taiwan. It makes up more than 50% of all chip production. You get TSMC, you are sorted. Talks are underway with Berlin. The company says it will take a call by August. So Germany is doing a lot of things right. They are mobilizing funds. They are wooing East Asian giants. They are also giving political support. Does that guarantee success? Maybe not yet. Germany's chip push faces three challenges. Number one, economic uncertainty. Announcing projects is one thing, delivering it is another. Last year, Intel announced project in Germany. Work was supposed to begin in early 2023, but so far there's no sign. The costs have been driven up by the war in Ukraine. Challenge number two, the lack of workers. Germany lacks 65,000 skilled workers, and chip making is a skilled job. So companies fear they will run out of labor, or worse, have to pay too much. Challenge number three, the cost-benefit analysis. Many experts ask whether the plan is worth all the effort. Germany will give away billions in subsidies, but that won't guarantee success. Neither will it ensure supply chain stability. My point is simple. Germany will be spending a lot of money for very little gains. So citizens are also doubtful. They don't see any logic in the plan, especially not in the middle of a cost of living crisis. So that's where Germany's chip plan stands. 
desirable but too ambitious. It's a dilemma most countries face, even India. Last year, India announced a $10 billion plan to become a chip-making hub. But the plan is yet to take off. We're talking about established supply chains here. Replacing them won't be easy. It will require major innovation and lots of money. Both appear lacking right now. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story starting with Iran. The country has test launched a ballistic missile. Iran says its missiles are an important retaliatory force against the US and Israel. In Guam, Typhoon Mawar has made landfall. The Category 4 storm has caused some major damage. We'll show you satellite images as well. In Australia, a massive fire broke out at a multi-storey building in central Sydney. Eyewitnesses felt the ground shake before walls of the building collapsed. And finally, what makes May 25th significant? Taking you back in history, on this day in 1969, a military coup led by Commander Jafar Nimairi overthrew the government in Sudan. Nimairi ruled Sudan for more than 15 years. He was ousted in 1985 in another military coup led by his own defence minister. We leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defence minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist.